Blomcast. Turning Points in History. Wendepunkte in der Geschichte. Welcome to the Blomcast, the podcast in which we look at turning points in history. And today I'm particularly excited because not only is this the first interview podcast we're doing, it is also an opportunity to speak to Kyle Harper, possibly the best asp expert on a vast question that has exercised historians for many centuries, namely the small historical detail of the disappearance of the Roman Empire. Did it disappear? And why did it disappear? Did it disappear because, like historians thought in the 18th century, the Romans were simply a decadent lot? Or did it disappear because they drank water from poisoned water supplies, from lead pipes? What made the Roman Empire go away? That's what we'll be talking today about with Karl Harper, who is, and let me read this, Professor of Classics and Letters and Senior Vice President and Provost of the o University of Oklahoma. Kyle, hi, and thank you for being with us. Thanks so much for having me. Kyle, you've written a fantastic book. Let me just hold it into the camera. Here it is, very much an analog copy, The Fate of Rome. And you write here about how the greatest empire humanity had ever seen could collapse in what was, after all, an astonishingly short time. And, well, just to start that podcast, can you, can you take us through what really happened in very quickly? I mean, which centuries are we talking about? Where are we in history here? Well, it, it took... Edward Gibbon decades and six volumes amounting to thousands of pages to, to answer your question. So uh, we can we can appreciate that it's not a, a simple one. Um, people talk about the fall of the Roman Empire and they often mean different things when they refer to it because it is a huge sprawling topic. We're talking about something that happens uh, over the course of centuries, something that arguably happens Uh, multiple times. In some ways, the, the Roman Empire comes completely unwound in the middle of the third century of the Common Era, in what we call the crisis of the third century, but is put back together. Arguably, it shouldn't have happened. It should have fallen right then and there, but it gets reassembled and enjoys a kind of second life um, that then comes apart really in two different phases. And the Western half of the empire, the Latin-speaking empire that encompasses Western North Africa uh, and much of Western Europe. The, the decisive moment in many ways is the fifth century when the, the central imperial power loses territorial control over this vast empire. But the, the deeper and I think most consequential fall of the Roman empire is the one that happens in the, the sixth century when essentially the, the reconquest efforts of the Emperor Justinian that are going extremely well um, come to a screeching halt and then are ultimately reversed. And over the course of a few generations, the Roman Empire becomes really a, a rump state um, that controls just a, a fraction of the territory at once held by the, by the mid seventh century. So the Roman Empire is a huge question. There are many different angles on it. Um, there are different falls of the Roman Empire, but for my money, we're talking about the, the disintegration of central imperial control over this vast Uh, sweeping space uh, that is, goes along with with processes of, of recession and decline. So urban uh, re recession, um, literacy and cultural production um, declining and so on. Now, there's a big question on how you can know and reconstruct all these things. But I mean, first of all, one thing that really excited me about your book is that I think when we were, we may have just been just the last generation who were taught that history is something that happens to human beings, to people, and that if we write history, you write exclusively about humans. Um, by now, there's been, I mean, the Annal School was already there earlier, French historical school, but um, By now, we are, we are beginning to write a history that is writing about people in their environment, cultures in their environment. And that also recognizes that when that environment changes, people will also change. They will need to adapt or indeed vanish. 
And I think that's something really radically new in history. You see this expansion of history over the decades, especially of the last century, from the stories of kings and generals to the stories of populations to the stories of the unseen parts of the populations. For instance, the parts of societies that didn't leave many documents, not many personal documents, workers, slaves, enslaved people in the colonies, etc. Um, and now it's really becoming a much larger um, affair. And your book makes that point beautifully that the Roman Empire did not exist without the surrounding nature and indeed could only be assembled because it happened to inhabit a particularly benevolent space of time. Um, can, you, can you tell us about that, what the, what the environmental conditions did with the Roman and for the Roman Empire? Right. Well, you're, you're right to emphasize this deep change in our consciousness as historians that's partly driven by our contemporary interests and concerns. I think that's perfectly fine. When Edward Gibbon wrote the history of the decline and fall, he was writing it in the context of an enlightenment and saw the past through the, the lens of the world that he lived in. And it let him see things and see dimensions of the human past that hadn't received the, the attention that they deserved. And so we're in parallel living at a time of very severe challenges around sustainability and climate change and uh, pandemic disease. And that, of course, influences the, the way that we look at the past. But it doesn't just mean that we're reading things into the past. It means that we're maybe attuned to, to sense things that had always been there and hadn't received the attention that they deserve. And uh, a second level of that is that the great contemporary concern about, say, the challenge of climate change has driven tremendous amounts of scientific funding in earth science and means that we have a very urgent need to understand the paleoclimate, to really understand the, the history of the earth system in order to have a, a deeper sense of its dynamics and the, the past of the system. So this means that there's a lot of um, expertise and funding and human ingenuity going into finding archives of past climate, whether it's ice cores, tree rings, cave deposits, uh, lake or, or ocean uh, sediment deposits that can provide us a completely new kind of evidence about the past of the earth system. So for historians, we're the unintended beneficiaries of this, this new data. So it's not just new consciousness driven by contemporary concerns. It's also new data that, that provide unexpected insights into the past. And I think for Roman historians, there have been many of these. And one is exactly, as you mentioned, that the, the period of the maximal expansion and flourishing of the Roman Empire coincided with a, a particular phase of the, the global climate, a particular phase of Holocene climate history that even the, the climate scientists called the Roman climate optimum. So it's not Roman historians who've made up that term. It's revealingly the, the earth scientists who've given the label of the Roman climate optimum to this particular period. What did that mean, that climate optimum mean in practical terms for people who were living then? It's a good question. And there's actually a lot of, of interest and research going into it um, right now. But it seems like for a period uh, of two to three centuries, from maybe the second century BC uh, or so down to the, the middle of the second century CE or AD, that the, the climate in the Northern hemisphere seems to have been slightly warmer than late Holocene averages. And uh, in at least parts of the, the Roman world, um, relatively stable, uh, perhaps characterized by reliable um, consistent and relatively abundant precipitation. Uh, and there's a striking absence of, of large scale perturbations like major, major volcanic eruptions. Um, there is a big one uh, in 43 BCE, but other than that, um, the period is notable for the quiescence of these big disturbing climatic events like volcanic eruptions. So it seems like the, the Romans benefited from an anomalously stable period 
that we think would have been uh, favorable to agricultural productivity in some of the heartland regions of the Roman Empire. But that's really fascinating because, I mean, now we have the war in Ukraine and we hear that, you know, Africans are starving if grain ships don't get out of Odessa. And back then, the I mean, Rome basically could only exist because it got grain from Egypt, of all places. Because Egypt's ecology and climate was very considerably different from what it is today. Well, it, well, there are similarities with today as well, though, and it's it's fundamental that Egypt doesn't receive a, a great deal of precipitation, uh, and so in the ancient world, uh, Egypt's economy is dependent on the the annual Nile flood and the the water and nutrients that that annual cycle provides. And it results in one of the highest yield agricultural regions in the ancient world. And so the Romans uh, are very interested in colonizing Egypt and managed to, um, to, to do so and to make it a, a crucial um, supply for, source for the, the Roman populace. And it's really kind of an amazing instance of integration. Uh, and any system like this, as it becomes more complex, um, can benefit from the kind of resilience that comes from having the integration of multiple regions. And so it means that in some sense, um, you can have a bad year in one region, but as long as there's shipping networks that can move food around, the system is more resilient. Um, but it can also create a, a kind of vulnerability as well, because you have a system that is suddenly dependent on highly complex chains of supply uh, that in some ways very parallel to our own world can, once they get disrupted, um, can then sort of fail in ways that are cascading uh, and can be very We had one ship society. getting stuck in the Suez Canal and exactly. that turned out to be a great problem for world commerce. And then, of course, we had COVID, which was the same. It reminds a bit of um, of the Chinese um, system of irrigation, which worked fantastically well and allowed a rice economy, allowed more harvests per year and therefore higher populations. But that whole system of irrigation, of canals, of dams, etc., required very intensive and sophisticated administration and maintenance. And it was very vulnerable, for instance, to disruptions from the steppes, from, from people coming from the steppes and raiding the place, disrupting these canals, or even simply destroying the tax base so that the bureaucracy could no longer work. So a complex system becomes vulnerable to its own complexity. Exactly. And I think that's that's a good parallel to what happens in, in the Roman world is they build a, a system that really is remarkably durable and robust in many, many ways. But um, it seems also susceptible to certain types of, of pressure and collapse. And it really is. I mean, you, you talk about the, the East Asian case um, as a as an example of the interaction of human factors like invasion from external adversaries, along with natural factors, say, um, flooding or um, droughts that are driven by poor monsoons. Um, and it's the same, it's ultimately the same story in the, the Roman world. It is both human factors, the building internal and external forms of pressure on a complex system in combination with uh, environmental shocks that prove very, very dangerous. <sighs> These environmental shocks interest me because um, you can see, for instance, also in the European Digital Ice Age that I did a little bit of work in, that a system that worked very well in the late Middle Ages because it happened to be warm and so a not particularly efficient agriculture could still feed enough people. But then the climate changed quite rapidly, dropped by two degrees, and all of a sudden the system could no longer work. And um, there was widespread disruption. There was widespread unrest. And indeed, you know, the societies that emerged from it relatively successfully were completely changed society. How did that work in the Roman world? Well, I think the, the um, Little Ice Age is a great comparison, both for, for our own times, as well as for thinking about late antiquity. I mean, for our own times, exactly as you say, 
um, a system that was in many ways very successful um, and allowed the population to grow, that allowed some of the, the pressure and, and fragility of the system to build up, um, is then systematically disrupted by underlying changes of about two degrees. Um, and, you know, that's, that's alarming for us. And of course, it doesn't sound much, does it? It doesn't sound like much. Um, but, but if you really look in the human record at what that means for the way it, it puts tremendous pressure on a society's system of productivity and exchange, um, it's an enormous degree of change. So I think that's one thing that historians can add is to say, that's a, that's a tremendous change that puts a lot of pressure on societies to adapt um, and societies can adapt to, to certain amounts of climate variability and climate change, but um, there clearly are thresholds beyond which it gets very, very difficult to, to adapt quickly enough. I think it's a good parallel for the, the Roman world as well, because um, it, it increasingly looks like um, there are changes of a very similar um, magnitude between the, the apex of Roman civilization, say the, the first century CE, which is certainly the apex of the population, um, territorial expansion, maybe the early second century, um, and the the period of late antiquity by the sixth or seventh centuries. It's a very different environment, and increasingly, um, historians and and earth scientists uh, are proposing and confident that we can consider this period uh, a late antique little ice age. So the late antique. Little Ice Age is coinage that's trying very much to, to point to the parallels with the, the Little Ice Age. And there's, there's still a lot of work going on in this, but it looks to have been at least in part triggered by volcanic activity. Uh, and at least in certain periods of the 6th and 7th century, to have, to have forced a, a climate um, downturn from the perspective of Northern Hemispheric temperatures, of magnitudes that, that do parallel with the, the Little Ice Age. And so two, three degrees um, of climate anomaly lasting for decade to, to multiple decades. And that puts a tremendous amount of stress on a society. And we see what happens in the late Roman world when um, suddenly uh, the climate is, is two degrees different. Now, let me just, before we come to what happens in the Roman world, let's just disentangle this to some degree because... It seems that everybody has got an aged uncle who says there's always been climate change, don't worry. It's completely normal. Climate has always changed. Society have always adapted. Um, people are just being hysterical. Um, today's climate change is different in various ways and perhaps most significantly in the fact that it's definitely connected to burning fossil fuels, to human activity, whereas the Roman Little Ice Age and the Little Ice Age proper had more to do with solar activities and with the um, with the Earth's um, the shift in the Earth's axis. So um, astrologically, ex astronomical events that were in no way controllable. But um, so we are talking about different phenomena here. Well, I imagine you can sympathize as an author of, of books about environmental history. Um, we get lots of emails from these uncles. <laughs> who, uh, who want yes, I can imagine. So do I. That, uh, that climate change is perfectly natural. And that is that is the case, that the climate variability and climate change are perfectly um, natural. But I don't think that the, the historical record um, provides much solace uh, that, that that's um, anything to be blasé or complacent about. Um, that what it tells us is that um, climate change of that magnitude of the magnitude that is likely to possible um, in, in the next few generations um, throughout the past has put extraordinary strain on societies with um, very unhappy consequences that, that involve a great deal of human suffering uh, and, and usually in the end violence. So we have to, we have to understand. T tell us what that meant to the Romans. To the, to the Romans, um, it, it meant different things, but um, I'll, I'll take what I think is the most resonant example that I 
started to describe earlier, which is the, the climate downturn in the sixth century. Fascinatingly, in the year 536 AD, there are a, a range of historical witnesses that describe an event that, um, that they observed that the sun seemed to, to dim or even disappear for a prolonged time. Um, of months to, to up to a year and a half. So th these testimonies have been sitting in plain sight um, since the ancient world. And historians tended not to, to take them very seriously uh, because frankly, the historical record is full of strange observations of skies that rain blood, of you know, all kinds of astronomical um, oddities. Miracles of all kinds. Everything. Um, so, so it's sort of, I'm not being unsympathetic to say that when you, when you see people say the sun disappears, um, to not think much of it, but it was really NASA scientists coming from the, the earth systems side who knew the, um, the ice core records for, uh, volcanic activity in past times, um, who started to realize that maybe these observations could be aligned with actual uh, physical evidence for things like massive volcanic eruptions. Then, um, so you can add ice cores that are, are generally a very- Let's, uh, Sorry to interrupt you, but I just, um, you know, I just want this to be, to, to be a, a podcast where you don't really have to have a lot of previous knowledge. So prior knowledge. So, um, Ice cores give us a sort of calendar because the snowfall of every year is compounded year by year. And so you can, if you drill down, you get a year by year record of what happened in nature in that year. And that, of course, also means, I mean, we as historians, we're usually used to archives and documents and reading weird handwriting. But all of a sudden, science is giving us a whole new uh, field to play on and a whole new set of evidence that is enormous and that really 30 years ago wasn't there. Right. It, it just wasn't. And, um, and it certainly in this day and age has to be a team effort too, because you still need people who know the, the ancient languages and the weird sources and the funny handwriting, uh, and to work with people who know the the language of ice cores and the the intricacies of geochemistry and how these records are assembled and analyzed um, because they're complicated archives uh, in their own right and it's the the consilience or the the alignment of these two completely independent lines of, of evidence that ultimately proves to be the richest and the ice cores are particularly important because as you say they preserve not only do you get annual and now sometimes even possible to get subannual um, reconstructions of atmospheric chemistry. Whatever gets precipitated is telling you something about what was up in the sky. And it lets us see things like the, the chemical signatures of volcanic eruptions. So it gets deposited, um, the, for instance, the sulfate peaks, sometimes even little teeny little fragments of the, the volcanic dust itself um, get deposited in a chronological record. And it was the alignment of the, the ice core record for volcanism with the, the written sources with uh, in particular reconstructions of temperature. And so tree rings are one of the most important um, uh, archives of the, the climate on the ground, so to speak. Um, and it takes certain kinds of records that are continuous and are very sensitive to, to environmental variability. So you have to have trees that grow uh, at a different rate, um, depending on whether it's wetter or drier, warmer or colder, and you have to understand those sensitivities. Uh, but the tree ring records started to show that uh, not only was this a period of volcanic activity, but also it got dramatically colder. So in 536, there's a massive eruption. In 540, 541, there's another massive eruption. And there's something about the the combination of these two back-to-back uh, -back events that seem to, to have a sort of um, dramatic effect beyond even what you might predict from the, the size of an individual volcano alone that plunges the, um, the climate system into this colder state that, that makes the decades of the 530s and 540s um, arguably 
one of the coldest decades or two in the, the late Holocene. So over the last 2,500 years, this looks like um, maybe one of the, the coldest or two decades on record. So it's a pretty significant, abrupt um, climate change event. We know that this causes harvest failure. These are societies that are they're poor. They're used to living on the edge. Most people are farmers. Um, they live in close contact with, with nature and its rhythms. Um, they're used to challenge. So they're, they're accustomed to uh, climate variability. They know that there's going to be a good year and there's going to be a bad year. And when you have a good year, you store um, some grain or you, you, know, you grow some more. Granaries are livestock. very important. Very. And um, these societies can handle a, a bad year or two bad years. But when you get this kind of um, shock to the system, that is a lot more than just a bad year. Um, it's a bad decade. That's something qualitatively different. So there, there's something in the, the social response that's nonlinear as well, that um, somewhere between having, say, a bad decade and a bad year is much more than, than 10 times worse. Um, it plunges the society into a new state. And um, what's interesting about this episode, and I think particularly as a, as a warning or reminder to us to, to confront the, the challenges that we face, is it then has very unpredictable effects. And one of them seems to be the emergence of a new infectious disease, um, bubonic plague. I should, I should qualify that. Um, the appearance of bubonic plague in the, the greater Mediterranean world. Um, plague is an older disease. It's naturally occurring in wild animal populations in Central Asia long before this. We know that it had moved in and out of human populations. But all of a sudden in 541, so right on the heels of the beginning of this massive downturn, there is a, an explosive outbreak of bubonic plague, which is the same disease that causes the Black Death. In many ways, the, the outbreak in the brain of the Emperor Justinian in the 540s is like a first Black Death. Um, it, there are eerie similarities and the, the eerie... but also with I mean I was astonished when I read that in your book um, losses of up to half of the populations in some in some regions it's really extraordinary and of course we don't have the same kinds of documents that they the historians of the late middle ages have so the the margins of uncertainty are perhaps wider but the the deepest eeriest of all the similarities is in the human testimony we have much less of it from the plague of Justinian. But what we do have only finds parallel in the entire testimony of the human history of disease with the, the witnesses to bubonic plague in the late Middle Ages and early modern period. Um, there's something distinctly devastating about this disease. Uh, we have very vivid, lurid descriptions of it uh, at the, the Imperial capital in Constantinople from multiple eyewitnesses who are very different culturally in their outlook and the kind of text they write, but they describe the, the course of the outbreak in the empire and particularly in the imperial capital. And certainly what they describe is crystal clear in, um, in, in witnessing uh, an outbreak of disease that compares with the Black Death in carrying off. And in Constantinople, According to these witnesses, it had to be something like half the population. And there's really only one disease that, that regularly in the human record does that. So for the Romans, there is this double disaster of a, a climate downturn and the appearance of bubonic plague, which have to be related somehow. It's, it's intriguing and challenging for historians like me. We don't totally understand the connection between these two events that are virtually simultaneous. Um, there probably is more than one way in which they're connected. Part of it is probably just that the populations are suddenly starving and extremely vulnerable. Part of it's probably migration. So it's probably desperate subsistence migration um, that may also contribute to the, to the arrival of the disease. We don't know. Um, it probably has effects on rodents, human populations are closely connected with other animal populations, health and plague is really an animal disease more than any other major disease of human history. Plague is always an animal disease, um, a non-human animal disease. So um, the Roman empire is the, the victim of this extraordinary uh, 
uh, environmental shock um, that comes in the form of climate change and disease. And I think that's a that's a um, salient reminder for us as well that the the effects of climate change are very hard to predict. You're talking about a very complex physical dynamical system that's um, very unpredictable, uh, very nonlinear. Same with human systems as well. Um, and the the relationship between the environment and human systems is very hard to predict. Um, and in the in the Roman case, the the I think warning is that in this instance that you have an environmental challenge that is multifaceted. And um, you know, for us, this is of course salient because COVID has reminded us of the the very disruptive potential of infectious diseases. And in our own world, we don't have a, a complete understanding of what the, the health impacts of um, climate change are likely to be, but it's certain that climate change will influence the emergence of infectious diseases. And it sometimes looks in the historical record like it's really that dual, dual threat um, that can pose the greatest challenges to societies. You make the point that already for an earlier plague, um, the success of the Roman Empire because it became also it's one of one of its greatest problems. There were all of a sudden very fast ways of communication. There were very fast ways of getting merchandise from one end to the empire of to another, and of course most of it to Rome. Everything converged on Rome. That enormous black hole at the middle of the empire that really devoured everything the empire produced. But of course. One of the things that could also travel along these ways were pathogens. Exactly. I mean, the, the, it's hard for us today, I think, sitting in 21st century societies, even with the reminder that COVID has given us, to, to really appreciate the, the influence that infectious diseases have had on human beings throughout the past. It's only for the last three, four generations that... Um, that people have died of non-infectious causes at a greater rate than of infectious causes. So infectious diseases play a tremendous role throughout the past, and they're uh, very unpredictable as well because it involves evolution um, and transmission dynamics of infectious disease. But we know that if you are uh, an infectious pathogen, if you are bubonic plague, if you are the influenza virus, if you are uh, the malaria parasite, if you are the, the agents of dysentery, um, you are a product of evolution. I've never really considered myself like that, but N well, if, let if, me try. I, I've probably spent too much time writing about these guys, but the, <laughs> these pathogens are products of evolution. They are trying to, to spread their genes um, and they, they face like any other entity, they face challenges, um, evolutionary and ecological challenges. One of their biggest challenges is how do you get from one host to the next? It's um, one of the two most fundamental challenges for any virus or bacteria that, that lives a parasitic lifestyle is um, how do I get from one host to the next? And then how do I survive the host's immune system? Because our bodies have amazing abilities to, to keep out non-human cells. So um, by anytime humans live in denser populations or in more networked populations, it helps pathogens solve their most fundamental evolutionary challenge, how to get from one host to the next. So societies in the past that have achieved higher levels of urbanization and higher levels of exchange so that there's trade between human populations. In other words, they're, they're more richly networked. We are doing things that absolutely benefit our species. There's obviously tremendous upside to urbanization and exchange, but it inevitably also plays into the hands of our parasites by uh, making it easier for them to transmit between hosts. So one of the, I think, constant dynamics of human history has been the, the interplay between our success and the way that that unintentionally benefits our parasites. And we know in the Roman case that, um, that this benefits uh, pathogens at kind of a, well, who are agents of endemic disease. So in the city of Rome, 
um, it's not just the the big um, dramatic pandemics. Those are interesting. I'll talk about them. But it's it's just the the grimy, low level uh, endemic pathogens that cause diarrhea and dysentery. Probably one of the most important burdens on human health in the past. That that as brilliant as the Romans are at, at civil engineering, don't solve many of the, the basic problems of public health. And so Roman population health is probably pretty bad, um, despite the, the achievements of Roman urbanization, or I should say in some ways, paradoxically, because of um, the, the achievements of Roman urbanization. But it, the Roman example also reflects the, the power of of emerging infectious diseases to cause uh, explosive pandemics um, as they spread for the first time through a, a population and take advantage of trade and connectivity. Piling on that climate change, we see that a really big storm is bro brewing on the Roman horizon. And climate change, you just made the point that it has tremendously unpredictable effects, but at least some of the effects are very sadly, very predictable. Um, and that also influences the functioning of a state, because if you have a downturn in climate and therefore a downturn in harvests, you, for instance, also have a downturn in taxes and taxes being paid and an administrative state that costs a lot of money and not to forget the Roman legions that patrol the border regions that cost a lot of money and will, like all armies, turn on you if you don't pay them properly, all of a sudden you get a host of problems that you didn't have before. That's right. And in the, in the Roman case, uh, I think we can contrast Two, two episodes that are separated by only a few generations. One happens in the second century in the Antonine period, the very height of, of the Roman Empire's power and population, mostly under the emperor Marcus Aurelius. There is uh, what seems to be a, a, a climate challenge as well as uh, clearly a novel pandemic disease outbreak that's named after the family of emperors, the Antonine plague. Although we don't actually know what pathogen caused it. We can speculate. But they might have preferred a different name, but... Um... They might have preferred a different name. <laughs> the, the, they got blamed uh, in the historical record. So the the Roman Empire, though, in a sense, sort of stabilizes. You can see the, the cracks in the system uh, because it does cause these short-term harvest failures, um, reduction of the, the population causes a reduction of the tax base, um, there's, you can follow the, the challenges in the, the history of Roman coinage. Uh, and so they, they ultimately have to um, respond, probably responding to inflation uh, by increasing the, the pay of the Roman soldier uh, that probably is, is associated with a decline in the precious metal content of the coinage. But the system does kind of restabilize. So you can see the stress run through the system and you can see the cracks but it does sort of settle um, and, and the Roman Empire um, is changed, but, but not fundamentally, it, it comes through that crisis. But if you flash forward just two or three generations to the middle of the third century, we witness again a concatenation of, of crises and it's not one dimensional. There's a, again, a massive pestilence. It's called by historians, the plague of Cyprian Again, a bad name because Cyprian's just a bishop in Roman Africa who happens to write about this. Um, he didn't have anything else to do with the plague, but it's named after him. And again, we really don't know what, what caused it, although there's, there's speculation. But what we do know is that there's a widespread um, outbreak of plague that has demographic impact. Simultaneously, there seems to be environmental crisis, environmental challenge, harvest failure. Simultaneously, there are multiple adversaries on various fronts of the Roman Empire. Persians um, are increasingly aggressive in the East, combined with Germanic federations that are increasingly formidable uh, and large scale in the North. Uh, that puts tremendous pressure on the system. And in this case, the, the currency falls apart. And um, when the when the money system, when the banks vanish overnight, when the currency system um, falls apart, 
that in combination with the geopolitical challenge, the, the health challenge, the environmental challenge, in a sense, proves too much. And this time the system breaks. And so you get one of these episodes of cascading change. And, and again, I think our world is very, very different. And we could talk all day about how different it is. But at the same time, this is a, this is a complex, integrated society uh, with a centralized state, uh, with a unified economy and currency system um, that faces these challenges and in the face of these shocks is fine until it isn't. And when it isn't, things happen very fast. When the environmental challenges uh, appear and the, the money system breaks and the banks go away and there's virtually nothing for people to, to trade in um, for day-to-day -day commerce, um, you know, we'll, would we feel our society is so different despite our massively greater scientific and technical understanding in the face of that kind of concatenation of shocks? I wanted to read um, a paragraph back to you that um, comes from your book. And although it speaks about the Romans, I wasn't quite sure which century it should speak about. Um, you say um, there had been a slow technology, technology convergence between the Romans and their Germanic neighbors. The evolution of more sophisticated enemies weighed invisibly on the entire edifice of the Roman Empire. But once the pestilence hollowed out the Roman frontier shield, the structural weaknesses of the imperial system were exposed to hungry and ambitious people of the far side on its borders, with ancient grudges against the belligerent empire. There should be no doubting the casual importance of the pandemic in the military crisis. It exposed the latent threat and allowed the frontier system to be overwhelmed by a violent tide. Um, this, in the times of a rising China, in the times of post-colonial um, post transformations of the world, doesn't only to talk about the Roman world. Well, I mean, I think that's, that has some, some resonance. And we think about, let me put it this way, the, the Roman Empire in the late 240s is celebrating the 1000th birthday of the city of Rome. And I like that episode because I think it captures something deep about the, the mentality of this society, but also the, the inherent tendency of societies to underestimate the potential for, for sudden change. And when they do that, Rome is remarkably an unwalled city. Um, it's, it's able to, to simply sit there without the kind of um, walls to defend it that are, that are often so familiar from, of course, thinking about medieval societies. And it's because the Roman frontier system um, projects the, the friction and violence um, so far away from the interior. But what's suddenly revealed in the, the course of the, the 250s, 260s, when you do have incursions um, deep into the, the heart of the Roman Empire, um, of course, not just into um, Italy coming across the Alps, but particularly into the, the Balkans, um, even into Anatolia, cities that were sitting there unwalled, um, all of a sudden, um, find themselves uh, confronted with, with enemies that had seemed um, immensely far away. So don't take any of that too literally, other than the, the, mentali the, the dimension of a society's mentality. Um, that didn't look um, foolish to, to leave Rome without walls uh, until it wasn't. And so, of course, Aurelian in the 270s builds the massive Aurelian walls. And again, I don't mean this in any literal sense, other than as, a, as an episode of, uh, to remind us how quickly um, systems can change under the, the concatenation of these kinds of shocks. And so societies can exist in, in one state um, that in a very short period of time will cease to exist and will seem uh, unimaginably different from the, the new reality. That happens um, to the Romans in the space of a generation um, in ways that I think are, are helpful to have on our sort of um, list of a repertoire of, of cases that we think about as we confront our own environmental challenges. 
But the shocks are very similar, don't you? Don't, aren't they? Because what you are describing makes me think of another hegemonic empire that pushed the violence to its peripheries, to Vietnam, to Korea, to Nicaragua, to Afghanistan, and um, had no violence in its center, or at least not large-scale uh, organized violence, and now is profoundly shocked that violence all of a sudden comes home. That violence is now all of a sudden happening in the middle of Europe, for instance. The great abil ability of this empire to project its violent side to its periphery and leave it there um, is crumbling. And all of a sudden we have, I mean, I live in Austria, that's 400 kilometers away from Ukraine. So, you know, this is not this is not a distant war that's being fought there. And all of a sudden, what could never have happened in the world I grew up in has become the reality of our present. What never could happen is now reality. And the other the other dimension of this that's important and we haven't really mentioned is the the internal so constitutional dynamics um, of of the Roman system. And again, it's a it's a good example of things things work until suddenly they they don't the roman imperial constitution as it's uh, more or less established by the first emperor augustus um, clearly has a great deal of durability it's one of the longest lasting sort of political regimes in, in human history uh, but it also rests on um, a, a number of unwritten rules uh, as well as um, a little bit of luck as well as um, uh, sort of um, uh, the ability of a system to, to function in those spaces where there are unwritten rules. So the, the main example is that it's a system based on the rule of one emperor without any clear rules for how you choose an emperor. And um, there are episodes where the system shows its cracks, where it temporarily breaks down, of course, at the end of the Julio-Claudian dynasty, very much at the end of the Antonine dynasty. Um, but, but sort of fundamentally, the system is reconstituted on the, the Augustan terms. Um, the, the Roman imperial system, clearly somewhere in the 240s and 250s, um, becomes much more internally dysfunctional. And so you have, you have a set of causes and consequences that get smushed together. The, the Roman state's capacity to function is going down, but then in the face of challenge, it goes down dramatically. Uh, and then as the challenges grow, the, the system sort of folds in on itself. And so you can actually trace the, the history of this, for instance, in the declining quality of the Roman coinage, um, which is sort of going down. You can see there's, there's sort of increasing maybe dysfunction or at least lowered capacity in the system. Um, and then when it breaks down, when there's no set rule for how an emperor succeeds to the to the throne in the system. Once that breaks down, it goes completely haywire. And so, in the two fifties and two sixties, you have dozens of emperors that lead to internal conflict, which again hadn't been completely projected outward in the the Roman past, but had been mostly projected outward to the frontiers. And when all of a sudden the the dysfunction of a society leads to such profound divisions and fragmentation that you have um, countless emperors or times when we're not even sure if emperors really exist. Um, this, is a, this is a difficult period of Roman history to study. And there are certainly multiple rival empires. Um, there's a, an empire in the East, there's the core empire, there's the empire of the Gauls. Um, it, it's why I said at the beginning that in some sense, I think if we really understand the the inherent dynamics of territorial empires, the Roman Empire should have come completely unbound at this moment, and this should have been the the first um, the the fall of the Roman Empire. And in some sense, it's maybe more surprising that it's ever even put back together. Um, but in addition to the to the parallels that you were drawing, the kind of seemingly increasing dysfunction and division within a society that reduces its capacity to solve um, basic problems and respond to challenges make it more brittle when those shocks to the system do appear.
It never quite became the same again, though, the Roman Empire. I mean, first of all, it wouldn't have stayed the same because, as you say, over more than a thousand years of history, any empire changes, any society changes. And, of course, it would have changed even without great crises. But one of the really remarkable things in the later empire are the soldier kings. They're no longer chosen from the Roman aristocracy. They are now chosen from who is the most ruthless general. Well, it does... It's a strikingly different social dynamic um, behind the the power of the imperial throne in many ways, um, from the the recovery of this crisis to the final breakdown of the system. Nearly all of the the dynasties originate from um, military officer families. Um, Most of them are from a tiny little area in the bend of the Danube. Um, And so in a sense, the Roman Empire really is taken over by um, this this kind of cohort of, of military officers who then set up um, a succession of imperial dynasties, but they rule from um, the the frontiers. So Rome remains a cultural capital, but um, is really immaterial to to the imperial court. Um, in many cases, the emperors rarely or never even go to Rome, <laughs> much less reside there permanently because they have to live in places. Um, like Constantinople or Sirmium, Sertica or Milan or Trier, um, to, to say close to the frontier. They get a new god. Um, it's a complicated story, but they, um, you know, they switch the entire religious system. But an important story, because this new god is an expert at, at apocalypse. The story of the new god comes with stories of the world ending, of the end of days, of the day of judgment. And in a world in crisis, that's perhaps a faith that is quite close to hand. It's it's there when it's activated. So the, the story that I think is important is that Christianity has inherently apocalyptic dimensions. It's a, it's a religion that, that has a vision of the, the fabric of the cosmos and time that that is rooted in apocalypse. But if you look at Christian writings in the fourth century, there's very little sensibility that the last judgment is imminent um, or the last times are at hand. It's really from around the year 500 that you start to see those notes become much more audible um, in the in the religious language of the times. And then particularly from the middle of the sixth century with the plague, um, with the late antique little ice age, that apocalyptic thinking comes to assume a place in in a culture that it never had. Cal, um, I'm asking myself what what uh, got you as a respectable ancient historian writing about respectable things. What got you into climate history? Well, uh, it's a, it's a few things. I mean, partly because I've always had a, a deep interest in natural science, and so very uh, amenable to um, finding excuses to to spend time reading about the the natural world, whether it's the physical climate or infectious disease biology um, or, or other related topics. So it's kind of uh, rooted in personal interest. Partly it's the excitement of what we're learning. Um, we're always learning new things about even the ancient past from new documents, better interpretations, new um, technologies, using data analytics and computers to, to see new things. We're always turning up new inscriptions and archaeology sites. Um, so there's always ways in which we're learning new things. But I think the the arrival of huge, rich paleoclimate data sets of massive insights from genetics and advances in um, genome sequencing are just very exciting kinds of frontiers where we're learning new things. And then I've been fortunate to, to be encouraged throughout my career by uh, mentors and teachers who've encouraged um, the study of natural sciences and human societies. Um, and not everybody, I think, um, has has always thought that that was compatible, but I think it's not only compatible, I think it's enriching and, and even, even something urgent. So um, a lot of it's luck and a lot of it's just personal interest. You... Um... We talked earlier and you described yourself as an amateur farmer. Now, I don't know how amateur that is, but usually when you are actually working on the land, that changes your perspective on things slightly. 
Do you think um, that that also has had an, an informative or an informing influence on your writing? Oh, definitely. I mean, I'm a lifelong uh, Oklahoman and uh, grew up grew up here and love the the country here and um, have always been a kind of avid outdoorsman. And so um, anything I can do to, to spend time outdoors and in nature, uh, I love. And there's definitely a, a personal dimension where interest in the environment, interest in nature, um, or um, a way of uh, sort of taking my um, non-academic interests and values and um, combining them with, with my day job. We've had this conversation and the parallel between the relatively distant past and the alter present future has been has been haunting this this conversation. If you had to place us somewhere in the Roman Empire, which century would you place us in? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. You know professional historians hate this kind of question. Um, uh, where do I think we are? I think we're... Um, We're not in in the year 248 um, completely oblivious to the to the challenges that lay just overhead. I mean, I would like to um, to think that in some ways the the comparison doesn't work precisely because we have this kind of not just scientific but also historical um, consciousness that will make us less blind. Um, you know, Churchill. Do you think so? No, Churchill um, in, in a well-known speech from the 30s spoke of the confirmed unteachability of mankind um, and the the inability of societies to to respond to challenges before it's too late um, that they they wait until um, disaster and self-preservation um, kicks in and then they they respond so that's the that's the pessimistic side um, but but I'm also um, a little more optimistic that that we can maybe mobilize um, the resources to to avert the the worst disasters but where where are we maybe that's too optimistic where are we in the the roman empire um we're we're probably somewhere in the the middle of the second century um and whether we can weather the the coming challenges um or not That means that we have three glorious centuries ahead of us. Well, that is optimism, if, rocky, if I've ever seen rocky, optimism. Rocky centuries, um, for sure. Um, I have, um, at some point, um, it seemed to me that, you know, we have a very important partner organism as human beings, namely yeast, which gives us bread and beer and wine. And yeast does what every organism does. It You plunge it into a sugary solution and then it eats everything it has in front of it and has a huge population explosion until it sort of chokes and um, on its own excrement and um, starves. And then you have the population collapse. Now, I sort of think it would be nice if we had learned something in the few hundred million intervening years since the since the evolution of yeast. And we certainly seem to have personally, whether we have collectively, whether we are not behaving exactly like other every other species, I think that's the big question. Um, a biologist I told this to once said, well, yes, you, but you don't know the second part of the story, which is that the yeast cells that survive the collapse, they change their metabolism um, in order to survive in the new chemical environment. Do you think that we as human beings, I mean, you're not necessarily as a professional historian, but as someone who watches this time with an informed eye, are we able to change our metabolism? That's the big question, um, I think, for, for the 21st century is um, there, are, there are two broad kinds of responses. Maybe one is, is technical and one is political. And um, any any version that's optimistic about humanity's future, I think, um, has to include success on both of those fronts. And so um, politically, from, from people's personal choices to our collective um, decisions about how to, to confront these huge collective global challenges, um, along with technological innovation, which again, the yeast can't do either of those. <laughs> um, they, they change their metabolism um, following uh, extreme stress and pressure and violence brought on by, by overpopulation and starvation. So 
Um, what we have to do is try and muster um, a, a mixture of both uh, political and technological adaptation that will um, allow us to, to avoid the, the worst um, outcomes in which our metabolism is changed for us um, by, by the natural world, because eventually it, it clearly um, will um, force us to, to make changes. The, the changes are much less painful um, collectively if, uh, if they're done with foresight and, um, and prudence rather than um, simply responding after the fact the way the, the poor yeast have to. Cal Harper, um, it has been absolutely fascinating talking to you. Thank you so much for making time for this. And um, what can we learn from history? I learned a lot from your book. Um, I'm sure many other people will too. Um, whether that means that we can learn from history, that perhaps is not only for another podcast, but probably for another generation to determine. But um, thank you so much for making the time. It was really a pleasure and a joy. My pleasure. Thank you.